Did I say how honored I was to be here? And what I was going to say at the beginning was, I love so many sweet people come. I just had it late. I was in a church for the first time in Maryland, uh, an old Pentecostal church, which was so good, as even my brother's words, so appreciate the encouragement this morning. I very seldom give prophetic words, so that was really, really dear to me. Uh, but the, uh, she was so good. She goes, Dr. J. I said, yes, the glory of God was all over you. I said, no, that's just the light glaring off my head. <laughs> I appreciate that, but this is what it looks like. I don't know what to tell you. You know, we tried to powder it down and to do this and that. It's not glory. It's just skin against the, with the light on it. That's it. The darker it gets, the shinier it gets. I said, I appreciate that, though. She goes, oh, I don't know. I think the glory was there. Well, it might have been, but the glare was definitely, yeah. <laughs> Just a fact. Yeah, some people around me are getting a bigger glare than they used to have. <laughs> I already have that extended forehead. It goes right over here. <laughs> I start shaving like this. Guys at the gym, look at me. You do that every day? Hebrews chapter 1. Just true. My baby will be here the second service. Wait till you see her. She's just unbelievably, just unbelievably beautiful and sweet. Linda, of course, and she will, uh, you'll probably catch her in between, but uh, give her a hug. Uh, it's, it's amazing um, with the schedule that we keep. She continues to look like she does. Yeah, I just thought I'd throw that in, you know. King James, hope you don't mind it. I know Pastor for sure is new King James. Love that. God who at sundry times, different times, appreciate my friends with these, especially my brothers back here, sisters. God who at different times and in different ways, like a puzzle, spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us in his Son, pre-existing incarnation, life, death, resurrection, and especially ascension, even where he sits at this moment. Whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Chapter 2, verse 10. Again, speaking about him. You know, I love hearing the pages, so appreciate that. For it became him for whom all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons and daughters to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. John, the Gospel of John, beautiful words. Chapter 1. Verse 14, verses we know. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh and tabernacle, dwelt among us. No parentheses, but the translators are just emphasizing this. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Chapter 2, verse 11. This beginning of miracles that Jesus in Cana of Galilee and Manifest, there it is again, unveiled what was once hidden for his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Exodus chapter 33, all the way to the other side. It's so nice being here because you've got an incredible Bible scholar. Really, at the end of his days, he'll, be, he'll really be known as a theologian of our day, sitting to my left, and it's so nice to be here with such incredible foundation of the word already here in this place. So I honor him for that. It's just beautiful. It's not always like that, so it's, it's so liberating just even standing here. Exodus 34, no, Exodus 33, verse 18. It's Moses. After simply three months from, that, from the great exodus through the Red Sea, listen to this, his cry, verse 18. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. 
Last two verses, then I want to say a few things and we'll pray. Isaiah chapter 62. Left here last year. Verse 2 and 1, verse 1, 2, excuse me. For Zion's sake I will not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest. Until though righteousness goes forth as brightness, and salvation as the lamp that burneth. The Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory. Now shall be called by a new name, by the mouth of the Lord that he will give. I began already saying that we're living in the most incredible time that I've ever known, never seen. Isaiah chapter 62 verses 1 and 2 are already happening. For Zion's sake, isn't it beautiful? It was what Jerusalem and Israel was supposed to be spiritually. That was to be their spiritual dimension. But it speaks of us. And for the sake of the church in any generation, when there has been a watchman set crying unto him, not unto governments, not unto pastors, not unto people, not unto the demonic, but unto him, that he would restore and make the Jerusalem of praise in the earth again. Well, he has answered the cry of the watchman. Listen to these verses. I just want to quote them again for you. For Zion's sake... I will not keep silent. He has broken his silence. And when the Lord utters his voice in the earth, I appreciate prophecy and I love talking. I love preaching. I love hearing men preach. I've always loved that. But when he speaks in the earth, the earth trembles at the voice of the Almighty. The whole earth is trembling, but it's positive for you and I. I said that last year. I just want you to know it's positive. He says this, for Jerusalem, for Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until. So there is a speaking by him and an unrest, if you will, by him until righteousness, the righteousness goes forth as brightness and salvation is a lamp that burneth. Right now, as I'm speaking this morning, he is causing things to be made right in every aspect of our world, every aspect of it, every nation, no matter what they say, even if they don't believe, he's causing it to happen. And salvation is encompassing the earth like fire anticipated coming to our families, anticipated coming to our churches, anticipated coming to our cities, anticipated coming to our schools, anticipated coming to our colleges, anticipated coming around the world. Salvation in unprecedented dimensions. But I love verse 2. And the Gentiles shall see your righteousness. If something's happening to them because they had no interest in us, that's changing. But something's happening to us. A rightness is coming to our lives, right with him, right with one another, right with people, right with relatives. He's just causing us to bear a righteousness, just not by a word, but by a reality of lifestyle. He's doing it. But I love this latter part. And I've come this morning for this one reason. And all kings shall see your glory. For that to happen, we must have his glory. If they're going to see it, that means it has to be with us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. What an honor to be here at this incredible church. Lord, even as I stand here, the ceiling has been removed from Victory Church. There is no ceiling here. It is now without dimension. It is now without any level of can't be, can't do. The limitations are off. What a moment in time for this church, for this people, for us, your people. Father, do something in our hearts this morning the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revelation of the kingdom of God, and your ultimate intention, as you said to Moses, that the whole earth would be filled with your glory. This morning, awaken us to it. Let a new cry and desire to behold you and to see you. Not just momentary, but not just the tangibility, but a manifestation, a dwelling, a walking, a tabernacling with us. Emmanuel. Father, I thank you for that. We were never to live without it. In Jesus' name, amen. It's an incredible moment in our history, our Bible history. Abraham's word comes to pass, the word to Abraham, and this great exodus takes place.
Here they are, 600,000 men, probably somewhere between 1.2 to 2, 2 million people. They never really know. It's in that range. Can you imagine he delivered them without a fight, without a sword, without a spear? All they did was crying on the hymn. And this awesome God, this incredible father that we have, heard the cry of his people, though they never saw him. They didn't even know if he existed. They only heard the words that were passed down, but they had never seen him before. They had no idea the power of his might. They came to Mount Sinai. And can you imagine three months after that, they're already belly aching and murmuring and complaining. Unbelievable. But that's his people. <laughs> it's who they are. All of a sudden, something happens. This thick, dark cloud comes out of the heavens and sits upon Mount Sinai. The New and Old Testament will declare that the mountain shook at it. It had lightnings and thunders. It was the first time that God moved out of his place into the earth. And him being there caused the earth just to quake like this. All the children of Israel backed away from it. And they looked up there and they thought, this is way too scary. They called it kabod. They said the glory of God is in the earth. It means heavy or weighty. It really means splendor and beauty and majesty. But they couldn't describe it. It wasn't by volume heavy. It was just like, ooh, that's heavy. <laughs> wow, that's heavy. Yeah, if, they, if it was the 60s, we would have had it for sure. Man, that's heavy. It was weighty, but the word in both, the kabod and the doxa, the New Testament, is the same thing. It's the splendor, beauty, and majesty of God. But it was hidden in this cloud, and Moses was called up into it. I love this. Everyone was afraid. They said, Moses, you go talk to him. So Moses gets up into the cloud, and in this beginning, intimate place, this beginning of beholding God in a way that he had never been seen before, there's something that erupts in the heart of Moses, and he says, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. I believe that it's a cry in every one of our hearts this morning. From the day that we were born again, there was a need to behold his glory. There's a cry in us. We have got to see your glory. It isn't this thick darkness. It is the splendor and the beauty and the majesty of Jesus Christ. Yeah. It would be the thing that would separate the people of God from every nation in the world. The glory of God was with them. It would enter into Moses' tabernacle. And when it got in there, nobody could enter in. The priest couldn't get in. You see, no man could live in that glory. Not then. Even in Solomon's temple, when it filled that temple, incredible moment, Israel's greatest day, even there, the people could not enter in. The priest could not enter in. Moses couldn't. Solomon couldn't. Nobody could enter it. He told Moses on that mountain when he cried for it, he goes, no man could see my face. I'll pass by and let you see my goodness. That's it. Even that experience caused Moses to have to wear a veil over his face because this experience with God caused his face to shine bright, almost so, so lit, so brightness that they literally needed him to cover his face. It's what separated the people of God. There will be a day in their history when the Philistines will hear the shot of his people as rebellious as they were, and they would be afraid, and they would say amongst themselves, uh-oh, God is with them. Who can stand this? Even the Philistines knew if the glory of God is with his people, it's trouble. We wouldn't really know it. It was this thick darkness. It wouldn't be till hundreds of years later, the prophet Isaiah in a moment, we'll have a vision. King Uzziah dies, and he has a vision into the heavens. The first man to begin, Jacob will see him upon his ladder. But this is the first time someone sees. We don't really know where this glory, this kabod came from. We don't really know what it is. We just know it's this thick darkness. You can't look into it. You can't see it. But God is in the midst of it. He is there. Isaiah will see and he'll look into this holy temple, this heavenly temple, and he'll see the, the Lord sitting upon his throne high and lifted up. And these seraphim will be saying one to another, holy, holy, not to him, to one another. They just can't help but to say, holy, 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 holy is he. And something occurs, Isaiah's watching it. The whole temple is filled with smoke. 
It's glory because they're giving him glory. And it's smoke now. It was this thick darkness. Now it's smoke. And he sees it. And the, it's so powerful that literally the, the, the temple doors shake. And he, his train, his robe fills the temple. Isaiah goes, whoa. We wouldn't see it again until the prophet Daniel deep into his life in Babylon, will have a vision of the Ancient of Days. His throne is established. He is white, but his throne is fiery, and he's full of fire, and his fire is going up and down, and Daniel's blown away by it, by the, the, and he hears thousands of thousands, 10,000 of 10,000 angelics ministering to him. In the heavens, he is glorified. They declare him holy, holy, holy. Their words create the atmosphere that he dwells in. He dwells in glory. John will have the best view. On the Isle of Patmos, he'll be taken up on the Lord's day. He's in the spirit. Then he's in the spirit. He's here and he's there. And he looks, there's a door now open because someone opened it. And he looks in and he sees now cherubim saying, holy, holy are, is he. And he sees this one sitting upon a throne and a lamb slain to his right. And he sees these elders as they, he, the elders hear this they bow down. They can't help but to give him glory. They can't help but to say he's worthy. They can't help it because he's dwelling there. And they're saying this to him, but there's not any smoke in there. There's not a cloud like in Moses' tabernacle. There's nothing but giving glory to him. It's what they do, not because they're commanded to do it, not because they're supposed to. They just can't help it because he's there. They've got to say to him, holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And the elders can't help but to respond. They're giving him glory. The prophet Ezekiel will begin to have the greatest view. Here he is. He's my favorite prophet without question. He's, with the, he's really uh, with, in the refugee area of Babylon, the river Chabar. And he all of a sudden has visions and he looks out of the north comes a whirlwind. Please know, and I know he shared it, but out of the north is where the north is always typified of where God dwells. Something's coming from the dwelling of God. Something that's with God is coming, and he sees it. He has no idea what it is, but in the vision, he sees four living creatures. They look like men. They all have four faces, the face of a man, the face of a lion, an oxen, and an eagle. And he looks, and there's fire going up and down on them, and they have these wings, and they're coming. He says, it's the sound of many waters, like the sound of the voice of the Almighty. And as they begin drawn to him, he's beginning to listen. He's not explaining. He's just writing. He says, they got these calves' feet, but this fire's going on. He says, the spirit is in the feet or in the wheels of the living creatures. And wherever the spirit moves, they move. The spirit goes, they go. The spirit stays. These creatures are governed by the spirit of the living God. Please hear me. This is not what, the, what, what glory looks like. This is what glory produces. All of those faces are in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is all man and was all man. He was the oxen, the one who came as a living servant, willing to give his life. He was the lion. He is still the lion of Judah. And he was the eagle from the very beginning who could soar over everything, born to conquer, making us conquerors. But the glory of God produces something that only it produces. The prophet Ezekiel in 25 years in the middle of it. Are you okay? You with me? Right in the middle of it. He's taken, I love this about him. He's taken to Jerusalem. I love this. That's kind of how I want to fly. He just sits taken there. I, I, I like to do that. I don't have to get in a plane. I just go. I, you know, I know my brother believing for the miraculous, but I'm not so sure we're going to get there, but I'm leading anyway. And he sees this. I, I, I'm, 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 as I'm reading it, I'm watching it. As he's watching it. And the Lord says, look, and the glory of God is in the temple. And the people are just doing what they're doing. 
And all of a sudden, the glory of God moves five movements to, to, to what we know now as the Mount of Olives. I couldn't believe it as I was observing it. You know what was happening? The glory of God was leaving the people of God, but not leaving the earth. It happened prior to that in history. There was a time period, I just said it, where can you imagine the Philistines came and took the ark? King Saul will live his whole life, and Samuel, most of his life, with Out the glory of God. I thought if a generation can live without it, so could we. Any generation. And Ezekiel's watching as they maintain and continue their their religious duties and their their religious ways and naming themselves the people of God. But there was no glory there. There was a temple with no glory. I'm thinking, how can they live without it? It's amazing. As Ezekiel's watching this, he's broken and breaking down. I realize now that the glory of God will never return to this temple. But Ezekiel will see another temple in his latter years. Almost at the end of his prophecy, he'll, it's, it's so specific, it's beautiful. What a temple. I'm not trying to establish a theology or some end time idea. I'm not trying to wreck yours either. I'm not doing any of that. I'm just looking at this temple. And all of a sudden, he sees the same vision he saw in the first chapter. He sees it coming, but from the east. It came from the north because it came from the dwelling place of God, but now it's coming from the east. Please, the east is always typified of the coming of the Lord, the return of the Lord, the visitation of the Lord, when the Lord is entering the earth to make changes in the earth. Always, he has, it's like the, a lightning from east to west that's typified of his return. And he looks, and out of the east comes the same vision. He sees these four living creatures. He watches their coming with fire going up and down them. These living faces, they hears the sound of it. And they enter into the temple. And the man that's with him brings them around to the south side of the temple. It came in, this glory, this vision of the glory, came in as living creatures, and as Ezekiel looks at the temple, at the south side of it, he looks, and now this water is coming out. It's to his ankles. He measures a thousand cubits. Another thousand is to his knees. Another thousand to his hips. Another thousand. I don't, can't even, don't have time for this. Four different one thousands. Incredible. The number four, just, four, just quickly, is God's intervention in the affairs of men. God is about to do something to change every man on the face of the earth. Watch this, watch this river. This river starts flowing, watch it. Ezekiel's watching it, and he's writing to us. He's looking at it. He says, man, it's so big, you can't cross it. It's so large, you can't miss it. Man, I'm, oh, I want to hit that hard. I'm looking for that. So he sees it, and he looks down, and he goes, it has trees of every season, and the leaves are for medicine. They're for the healing of the nations. A healing bomb that's birthed out of the church because something's here. It goes and it flows, watch, and it flows down to the Dead Sea. I love this. Ezekiel right. And the Dead Sea lived. The glory of God will bring life to the deadest places. There's nothing that doesn't live when the glory of God touches it. He said, every, every fisherman, every fisherman, not just one, every fisherman took great catch. She's been a dream of mine. I believe it from the very beginning that something would take place in our earth and in our lives that every church would be affected by it. Oh, I love this church. This church I don't know about the other churches in this town. I, that's not my interest. This is my interest, this church. But I know this, though, the Lord will do something here that will touch every church. And I don't mean, hey, 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 wait, wait, wait. I don't mean 12 people leaving here and going there. No, that's not what I mean. No, no. That day's over. This glory would not any longer be in a thick cloud, dark cloud. It wouldn't be in smoke, and it wouldn't be. Uh, in, in uh, uh, I mean, excuse me, thick darkness or smoke or cloud. It would no longer be in a building, but it would be in a temple. When he was born, he was the beginning of something that was never seen in the earth before. Now the glory of God was in a man. It wasn't water even, it was in a man. It was in the man, it surrounded the man. He himself would manifest his glory to his, to his disciples. They would see it. Please know this. 
disciples who you are this morning. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad we are disciples. But we need the glory of God because when the disciples saw the manifestation of it, they believed. We were never to live without it, ever. He himself, the Hebrew writer says, brought us to glory. It was his intent. His prayer to his father was simple. The glory that I had from the beginning, I give it to them, that they might be one. There's no way there can be oneness without the glory of God. We got to have it. Got to have it. Never to live without it. Then he prays, prays my favorite prayer, which is every day for me is, I say to him, I'm joining with this prayer. I say yes to it. He said, he said this, and I pray this after he's praying, that they may be where I am and that they would behold my glory. What does it do? Can I quote a couple verses? I'm through. This was fun. Hope it was okay. Listen, let's quote out of, the, out of the couple of the epistles. For we with open face, unveiled face, the writer's talking about Moses. He's comparing us to him. Moses had it covered. We're uncovered. We with open face, as in a mirror, beholding the glory of God. I'm not looking at me. We're not looking at us. We're looking at the glory of God, which is the manifestation, the revelation of the splendor, the beauty, the majesty, the preeminence of Jesus Christ. We with open face, as in a mirror, beholding the glory of God, are changed into that same image from glory to glory to glory to glory to glory. We're supposed to be. I, get a lot, I, I like this. This is why I love, I, I was telling the young people that he, he's a better pastor than me because when, when the people would come to me and, you know, they feel like, my, my life's going up and down, I'm going, yeah, great. That's good. You're in, you're, yeah, you're getting winnowed. That's good. You're on the threshing floor. That's great. That's, that's a great place to be. It, it is. And they'll say to me, oh, I'm going through such trouble. And I'm smiling again. I'm trying to smile too much because it could be offensive. And I'm going, good. And they says, what are you doing? What are you talking about? I said, well, listen, I just want to encourage you. This light affliction is working in us a more eternal weight of glory. By the way, this is the weight, not to do so many words, the weight is an expanse unmeasurable. This glory is to be in us by the revelation and the outpouring of the Spirit. It's to be around us. It is to be manifested in this place everywhere we go throughout the earth. Can I do another one? God, who has commanded the light to come, out of, to come out of darkness, has shined the light of his glorious gospel in, the, in our hearts. The, the glory of God revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. The knowledge of the glory of God is in the face of Jesus Christ. Moses couldn't look into his face, but Jesus Christ has come so that we can look into his face. And as I see him, and as we see him, we come into the knowledge of the splendor, the beauty, the majesty, the preeminence of Jesus Christ. As we see him unveiled, we are changed to that same image from glory to glory. This one you're going to like the best. It's one of the first verses I learned when I got born again, and it was taught to me about 100 million times. It's the, one of the greatest faith, faith verses that we ever had. We had to memorize it in Bible college. I, used to, I hated the verse. See, because I thought that glory and heaven were the same thing. When, when I was going to be brought to glory, I thought I was going to be brought to heaven. Heaven and glory are not the same thing. The heavens is where he dwells, but it's filled with glory. What he wants is the earth to be filled with the glory of God. Okay, so my God <laughs> shall supply all of your needs. It's all exterior needs, whatever it is we need. According to his riches in, so there is a wealth that comes with the glory of God that without it, that wealth is not here. So here's the declaration of God. 
for Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until. How long is until? Until. Until what? Until the righteousness, not ours, the righteousness, goes forth as brightness, and salvation is a lamp that burns. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness, and all kings, your glory. I want us to get prepared with great anticipation for the return of the glory of God to the people of God. We have been living without it. It changes us. It alters us. It alters the earth. It alters everything. It is a dimension of him indwelling that we have never known. If it left one generation, it leaves other generations. I will not live without it. We will not live without it. It isn't going to come some sweet by and by. Get ready. It's on the way. He will begin to cause the glory of God to enter our world in a way that we have never known before. Nations will change. Kings, the king of the United States, the king of Arabia, the king in Afghanistan or Pakistan, the king in China or Korea, you name the king. Something's happening to the people of God in every nation of the world. The kings of the world shall behold the splendor, the majesty, the beauty of Jesus Christ because it will be in us, flowing through us, and that brings a power of God unprecedented. Stand with me, please. I'm sorry for this little pebble this morning, but we've got, it has to be said to us. And I don't know any other way to say it. I've trimmed it down. Trust me. Well, I shouldn't say that. Cliff notes. We, we good? You, you got it. Yeah, beautiful. Just checking in with the boss. Everything okay, Deb? See, and, and I can't help but to declare it, you know, just the way I am. I just, I just love, for me, this is just an absolute truth that I've been believing for. Research has studied, and I thought, there's no way. We, we, this, we have to, it has to be you. We can't produce it. We can't. It has to be you. And I'm so thrilled to know that he's heard our cry, and it has begun. I want to awaken it in us this morning. I beseech thee. We sang it this morning. The girls sang it. She didn't finish it, but it was, it was, it was the two songs we did. It, it's been our cry. Have you heard it? Show us your glory. Yeah. I know what I was anticipating. Some thick darkness, some Shekinah, some cloud. I can't see. No, 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 no. If anything, this causes us to really see. It doesn't blind us. It opens our eyes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. It makes everything crystal clear. What a moment in time for us. So I just want you, if you don't mind doing this, if you're new, you don't have to, you could do this. Why don't you do this? And so I'm good with that. I still don't understand how the Patriots lost the Super Bowl, but anyhow. <laughs> you know what this weekend has been with the young people? I didn't do it this morning, but I, I had to do it with them. It's supernatural weekend for the young people. I call it super normal, naturally supernatural. That's why this morning I want to laugh and enjoy ourselves. These are, this is a mystery, the glory of God. It comes out of a book that most people don't even touch, the book of Ezekiel's prophecy. They just lay off it, though. But it's just too real, too real. Got to have it. So here it is, though. Lord, awaken in us this morning, beginning with me, a cry. Show us your glory. Got to see it. Got to have it. Our kids cannot live without it. Our nieces and nephews cannot live without it. Our siblings cannot live without it. We cannot live without it. The glory of God, as you said to, to, uh, to Moses, as I live, saith the Lord, the whole earth shall be filled with the glory of God. Let it be, let it be, let it be. We say yes to your prayer that the glory that you had from the beginning, we would have it and that we would behold you where you are and we would behold your glory. That 
was your cry and your prayer. I say yes to it. Father, I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. How about just giving the Lord a hand for me? Thank you. Great. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, please sit. Yeah. There's a whole other portion I really wanted to come from this morning. I, 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 I love this thing, this beginning part of the glory of God. I, I love this whole inception to it right now, even this morning. I love that. But there was a time period that I really wanted to come and declare to the church. So I want to say it to you in this manner. It was that moment of time that Moses' life and ministry was coming to an end and Joshua's was the beginning. It was an incredible time. I love the history of it. But I, I, it, one thing always bothered me. This is still the words. I'm just explaining it this way. You understand. I always bothered me. The word of the Lord to Joshua from the very beginning, my, my servant Moses is dead. That always bothered me. I thought, that's an indictment against Moses. I mean, what a great guy. Look what he endured 40 years of that. Kind of reminded me of some of my pastoring times. I thought, look at this. I mean, this is just this is indictment. Then I realized this. Here we are, 600,000 men. All of these, this whole generation could not enter into the promised land. Two men would go. Joshua and Caleb, you know this history. I just want us to hear it. Two men would go. I, I was always impressed with that. But then over the years, I began to be, to be a heart of, 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 of travailing heart and of sorrow. Thinking this, I knew that we had grown up in such a moment like Moses. He took care of us. But the grumbling and the grime and the way we acted and all this was going on. It wasn't even the promised land, but he took care of us. We grew up under this, this kind of thing, under, under this kind of pressure. It's how our life has been. And I thought to myself, I want to make sure that I make it across. I don't want to be left back there. I don't want to die in the wilderness. I don't want to die even though you took care of them, took care of us. I don't want that. I want the promise. I want everything you declared. I want everything you promised. Everything that we're to have. I want things I don't even know I'm supposed to have. I want everything that's in your heart. I don't want to be caught back there. But then I began to realize that the percentage that come out is so small. Two men out of all of those. And so it began my cry for my brothers, for our brothers, for my friends. But I realized there are some that just won't. Even some now, they just carry. They can't let go of that thing. But Joshua will come at 80 years old, and you'll never hear him talk about it again. You'll never hear him refer to Korah. You'll never hear him refer to Aaron or Miriam. You'll never hear him refer to the mountain. He'll refer to Moses' law, and he'll live before the presence. Those are the only two things he takes out. I want you to know, my brother, the Lord raised you in that dimension, raised you in that time period, raised you in that hour, but he has kept you for this day, for this time, for this hour. Just like Joshua and Caleb, he has selected you. It's been so good for me, though, because when I pray and travail over my brothers and my family members, the ones that I love, I so want them to cross over. But I realize how difficult it is, how almost impossible it is to let that go. We want to drag along with us a core. We want to drag along. We want to warn the next generation. Well, it's not always going to be good. It's going to be bad. you got to watch out. But Joshua never says that. There's this thing in his heart he knows. I don't care how many kings are in the promised land. He'll, I can conquer everything. I don't care how many valleys. I don't care how many giants there are. I don't care how many walled cities are. There's nothing impossible. And my brother, even now, the Lord's breathing into your freshness of spirit that you would cause the people to inherit not just a portion of the promise, not just Jericho, but all of it. And even as the Lord has set you here to cause many of the things that have become kings to the people of God to bring them down, that a generation can come and fully inherit the promised land, fully inherit the promises. It is the beginning. You have been right. You have been right. Even the preparation, even this word that you had, I'm going to put a print on you here. He said to the young people after I spoke on Friday night, he stood up and says, I had a vision while we were here tonight. He said, you know what? The Lord's going to anoint you to be an evangelist. He wants to bring in 300 of that age group. Come on, man. I just stood there. Oh, yeah. I just said to him, yeah. And I just, I just, I wanted to go up and chest butt him, but I was afraid I'd hurt myself. Beast. But I looked at him, and I just thought, even this morning we're singing the song, I wanted to lay my face on the floor and say, thank you. Do you hear the cry out of the earth? 
We want to see your glory. But I thank you for what he knows and his cry of his, even his preparation for a sickling, preparation for a harvest, everything he's done. I so thank you for that. And my brother, you'll see the Lord increase the finances. That's why I said the ceiling's off. The ceiling, I'm standing in this room right now, and there's no ceiling on this building. I think it's beautiful, but the ceiling is gone. And it isn't a cloud up there. There isn't a, 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 it isn't brass. It's, it's open to the heavens. It's open to the door. Everything is open. And God is going to begin to strengthen you and Dev and strengthen the team to begin to believe for God to do that which has been declared. It's even hard for me sometimes even saying these things because you know how difficult it is sometimes for me to say this because of eschatology, because of some thoughts. But sometimes it's so difficult to say some of these things because of the way we've been living. It's like a dream for the glory of God to be here. I mean, Jesus prays it himself. It's like beyond what we could ever have. But I'll tell you what, you know this though. We have been faithful to this word, and the Lord has come to honor it. So he begins to strengthen even now, refreshing your spirit. This apostolic mantle will increase. It is of a new day. It is of a new ascension of the people of God. He has making critical and necessary changes to it, and he is forming this very thing within you and within this people. And as a forerunner to this, you know, I love this thing. Even when Joshua gets there, though, it's not about Joshua. It's about the people. It's not really about just him alone, even though he leads it. He wants to see the people of God with great inheritance and inherit it. You will see the Lord raise up your young son, your son's generation. You'll watch it grow and grow and grow. You'll watch the Lord increase the team under him. You'll watch the Lord increase him. You'll see a dimension of Jesus Christ in all that age group. You'll watch and see a generation rise up. The things you saw, the things you declared, even for you and her, there's going to be a whole nother level of intercession, a whole nother level of crying out, where there once was, oh God, please, it's going to be, oh yeah, God, please. There's just going to be this dimension of change as he causes you to behold him. This is the beginning of the revelation of the gospel of the kingdom of God to this place. This is the beginning of the revelation and the manifestation of the glory of God. Don't anticipate anything of the old culture or the old nature. Just prepare with an open heart to see him. He will not forewarn you. He will simply move in and it'll be as though he is standing in the midst. This is not a temporary or a momentary thing. The Lord has come to tabernacle with his people. He's come to stand with his people. He has come to answer the cry of his people. And my brother, I just want to say to you, I just want to say to you how pleased the Lord is with you and with Deb and with the team. It's, it's an expression that the words just aren't really good enough for me to express. There is just this absolute security within him, this absolute knowing within him Without question, he nods to the earth right now, and it's just, just this clear nodding. This is my man. This is my woman. This is the place of my dwelling. Prepare for the supernatural. I, I mean, it's going to say this, for the supernatural to come in a supernatural way. Prepare for the supernatural. You can say to the young kids, listen, you pray for each other. You lay hands on that one. That one's sick. You lay hands on that one. Bring someone to you. Bring God is about to explode in the supernatural in this place, and it will not be momentary. I, it will not be so that everybody talks about Victory Tabernacle, Victory Church. I apologize for that. It isn't that they would talk about this church, though they will, positively. It isn't so that this church is well-known throughout the world. It is so that what he begins in this church, he desires it to flow throughout the state, throughout the nation, and throughout the world. Much of this of the overseas and much of the apostolic stuff as, as the mantles begin to change and, and, and as the Lord is, 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 is rewrapping the, um, the baton and reshaping the baton, as this begins to take place over time, it'll be crystal clear how, this is go how it's released, how it's the dimensions of it, without me saying anything about that, but it'll be there. It, 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 It'll be crystal clear, the timing, it'll, it'll be as though it never happened, but the Lord has already prepared a day to release you and her into a whole other dimension. And when that day comes, my brother, it'll be in greatness and in glory and in dimensions of God, unprecedented.
So even in this, the Lord is, is, is drawn near to refresh the earlier call of God, the, that pastoral teacher feeling and emotion that you had with uncertainty, how would I be? Even where the Lord led you, it just seemed like, well, maybe that was the wrong place, but it wasn't. The Lord has had his hand upon you. And he knows this about you, though. He leads you very gently. Uh, he pushes me. No, he doesn't push me around. He pushes. He does. He's very careful. With cords of mercy, the Lord's always drawn you because he knows that you are a man of tender heart and tender spirit given by him, sometimes very misjudged because of that. But you'll see the Lord, as this, the Lord, as this begins to happen, will begin to visit you again to rekindle the passion for the purpose of God, rekindle the desire. The old school of what we understood as ministry has come to an end, my brother. The Lord has, will begin to cause, to arrest your heart and your family's heart to once again serve him in a way that's been dormant. You thought because at a time that maybe they were wrong, maybe they, it was all wrong, it wasn't all wrong, it was all right. Timing was going to be a key. And in many ways, if the Lord did not visit his people in such a way, you, you, it's not necessary for an instrument. If we're not going to cook, I don't need a pan. If we're not going to cook, I don't need utensils. If we're only going to cut grass, all I need is a lawnmower. In other words, you're a necessary element to what God is doing. If he didn't do it, it wouldn't be necessary. Do you see? That's why we wait on him. That's why we're patient with him. He's the one who knows. He's the architect of the house. He sets the members as it pleases him. I just have to wait. I know. I, yeah, I'm not, I say that. Uh, like, I'm a real good waiter. Not, not very well, you know what I mean? Yeah, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm running in my sleep kind of thing. But I've had to learn to trust him and wait on him. See, we love what's going on here, but this is way less than the dimensions the Lord has spoken. We've been living with, 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 with little water, and, and every once in a while, the Lord, if you don't mind, spits into the earth, and we go, oh, wow, unbelievable. That's because all we've had. He doesn't want to spit in the earth. He wants to move in the earth. He wants to live in the earth. He wants to walk in the earth. So, dude, prepare yourself. Even now, seek his face. Begin preparing yourself. It'll come through him, of course. It'll come through the order of things. It doesn't have to be a title or a name, but the Lord's brought you to his house and to the kingdom of God that uh, this incredible tender heart would be the shepherd's model throughout all the young people, that they would be sensitive to every person they come in contact with, not special people. They wouldn't judge a man by his color or by his creed or by his standard of life or by his car. They would judge him as being the Lord's and loving them equally. Beautiful. You're, this, you're the man that the Lord said, listen, when I was sick, you, you came to me. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. That's you. And so just understand the Lord is awakening this thing fresh within you so that you will be able to trust him and you won't shrink back because really, it, you never have, but you've just been careful and cautious. But you know, the Lord over this time has caused you to trust his leaders and trust men, hasn't he? <laughs> it's been very good. Not just good, very good. And so dude, it's time, baby. Get the dust off the scriptures. Get the dust off the things you've learned. Get the dust off the prophetic words. Get the dust off the dreams and visions. Set them before the Lord. Don't twist his arm. Just say, God, yo, I'm yours. I'm ready, but I'm waiting for you. Thank you so much for joining us today. If God has impacted your life through this message, please join Victory in reaching people all around the world by sowing back into the kingdom today. You can give at rvictory.org slash give or download the Victory Church app and select give. Find Victory on social media for bonus teachings and content all throughout the week. 